Hello and welcome to the Xenothesis podcast. This is episode 43, in which we're covering chapter 1 of part 3 Chutkai Chutak of book 2, Adulthood Rights of the Xenogenesis Trilogy by Octavia Butler. My name is Richard Acton, and I am joined uh, in this uh, ship entity by my co-host. Michael Glinka, hi everyone. Um, you sounded very happy the way, like, I, 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 I sensed a subtle change in your voice when you said catch tag very like almost perfectly and you're like <laughs> sort of very proud of yourself <laughs> uh oh dear yeah i mean it, it, it's more of a like hesitation of um am i gonna say this right <laughs> and then when you nailed it you're like yes that the little, i could hear that little bounce in your voice <laughs> yeah so a slight sense of smugness and having achieved it <laughs> yes exactly uh no <laughs> but we'll see how that plays out going forward but i mean, I mean it, how many chapters it's... are there like in the in the in this part um, like 20 something a few yeah <laughs> so you'll have you'll have quite a lot of practice to um pronounce this yeah yeah i think i, I mean i i had the audiobook to tell me how it's kind of pronounced at least i mean i'm, I'm assuming whatever it is that the audiobook reader said is is, is canon on pronunciation <laughs> i mean yeah <laughs> yeah no. Oh, but it's interesting. It's a <laughs> uh, we are in the new part. Uh, finally, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. interesting. And as as you said, you know, we are on the not yet on the ship, but maybe soon. Um, well, I mean, we're kind of, we're on the um, the low entity, right? We're, yeah. Well, uh, and then we have uh, some interactions with one of the um, what is it? The uh, kind of shuttle, the little shuttle, shuttle the, entities. Yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, a, a male Chitkai Chitak, um relation of some kind, and I'm not really sure how that how the ships work in that regard. But yeah, yeah, it's 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 mm. a weird thing, right, Consa? Because um, it just reminds me of like when the first very first episode when we were recording, not first episode, mm. maybe there was one of the. Do you remember those little uh, on the ship, those little entities that were like ma- uh, allowing the Onkali to travel, like those little discs that were basically mm. releasing slime underneath, and we were like hypothesizing about uh, superconductivity and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, it's just it, it, to be honest like each time i f- think about the ship it's still it's a mechanical thing it's not an or- organism like they still keep saying this it's actually a massive organism living in sim- symbiosis with the Kali, but like it's it's still such a weird concept yeah uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to picture as well because we never really got like a um we never saw like an outside view of the ship, right? We we saw yeah. lots of stuff inside it, yeah. And we get the impression that it's biological, and it has these kind of like tree-like structures in it, and it had this whole, you know, jungle biome thing. And there was that like weird tube where you kind of went through an elevator in a giant gas bubble to visit like the observatory. Yeah. Giant fire bubble. No... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was no like, uh, what's the shape of the thing, right? So we don't have a straightforward. Yeah thing to picture well i mean presumably it's like a vaguely spherical or slightly elongated ellipsoid or something but no well it says here in the one of the chapters that we'll cover today is that actually one of the ships when it's in this in the air it's it's spherical so i assume it's the Hmm. same for the main ship entity but like still like it's it's still there's a lot of questions that have not been answered yet and it's mm. interesting. I think that this chapter starts. They finally sort of start explaining what the ship actually is. Yeah, there's a couple of interesting revelations about little details about that kind of thing in in here, which is always fun. Yep. Uh, oh. So uh, uh, that said, shall we shall we get to those and uh, yeah, talk absolutely. about your your prediction for this chapter? So yeah, my chapter one prediction. Um, I thought. Because I already can, after that many episodes, you know, reading Octavia Butler, if I didn't guess it by now, there has to be some time skip at this point. And mm-hmm. I saw, thought there's going to be some time passing. And, you know, definitely Akin will be older. I didn't know how much older we're going to talk about here. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought maybe already on the ship, trying to learn about Don Kali and trying to convince them about the human actor. But I sort of got up ahead of myself in here. A little bit, but like the, the it it seems like the kind of broad strokes of that for for this part 
were probably going to play out, right? We yeah. got we got our time skip, um, and it seems like Akin is is planning to do his his uh, pitch for the human act yeah. try, but is is not uh, not and, yet there. And the some time passes is actually seventeen years, in fact, because yeah. when the uh, previous part finished, Akin was three, and now he's twenty. So. Yeah, so quite a big time jump. Yeah, it's a really you know mm. substantial time jump, and that the fact that nothing really happened in between, so um, it's surprising, I would say. Mm. Although I suppose we don't necessarily know no, what what happened, um, yeah. what happened in between and whether or not that will come back. Because a few times when, um, like for example, when uh, we had the time jump in the the first book of about a year, when Lilith was living with. Uh, the Owen Carly and and before she was in the like the the um, training room she, yeah. where she was you know uh, waking up the humans you know her whole kind of relationship with um with Chidaya and and uh, Nikanj and um the rest of them evolved like that whole kind of yeah. family unit uh, yeah uh, with Nikanj's other two mates that that you know, became a thing where right? she sort of became somewhat accepting of, of some degree of intimacy with the Owen Carly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which uh, we only kind of got like dropped back in uh, to how she reacted to stuff subsequently. So I suppose we might have a similar uh, similar pattern here where the experiences that have occurred to, to Tino off screen have some implications for his behavior. <laughs> well, yes, yes. Mm. We do have some... Um... We'll have something about this now. So shall we go into the chapter mm. then? Yeah, yeah. Right then. So the chapter one uh, starts with Dichan and Tino talking about Akin. Um, or rather, Dichan trying to talk about Akin's wandering around. And here, uh, cue in the Wanderer by Dion uh, song. <laughs> for all those who played Fallout 4 will know the song. For those who don't listen to it, it's pretty good. Um, <laughs> although it's, you know, Akin's wandering around, but although in Dichin's opinion it's too early for him um, he seems to not to understand that Akin may be going through a human version of puberty or early adulthood and as Tino is telling him you know the boy is trying to be independent you know show off and meet girls um, but mm-hmm. in Dichan's opinion the 20 year old Akin is more of like a 12 year old in human terms um, I don't know like hmm. It sounds like I mean, a you know when the kids some kids are more uh, adult like than uh, what they can be showing off and still. Yeah, I, mean, it, I think it's it, it's kind of a complicated mix here, right? Because you've got the the human and the Oankali development like schedules, as it were, mixed in. So there's a yeah a, a contradictory set of. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I can imagine the biology, like, you know, imagine us humans, you know, we go through puberty between the age of, like, 12 to, you know, what, 16, 17, mm-hmm. and maybe 18 in some cases. Um, mm-hmm. And then imagine, like, our lifespan suddenly prolongs itself because we've mixed with an alien that has completely different biology and also those, like, cycles I feel like the mess that it would create in the hormonal mess in the in the young um, onkali constructs is quite substantial, I would say. Because one, they go through metamorphosis, yeah. then they have to go through puberty, then they go through metamorphosis again. So, mm. and the thing is, during the second metamorphosis of the onkali, they're starting to be get interested in the you know male, female, or the uloi parts, right? You know, just the whole sexuality mm. and you know making family and stuff like that. Whereas mm. the in humans, you get that when you're twelve. <laughs> That's when you, the puberty hits you, and you're like suddenly you realize, you know, you like girls or boys or both, and then you're like, oh, mm. Mm, well then. Uh, so what's gonna happen is it's gonna be even further emphasized. <laughs> yeah, it's an interesting one because it seems like the it seems almost like the uh, Owen Carly kind of let the human development get most of the way through, but without permitting the fertility bit to actually uh, come to fruition and yeah. then there's like the the next couple of Owen Kali metamorphoses or whatever the the phase is I'm not sure how because I think the, there are two but I'm not yes. sure at which point the first one happens or if it's if that's already happened and and now the uh, uh, I, I forget which which of the metamorphoses Akin is uh, 
so um, I think going to be experiencing next. It's the second one with the whole family thing that, like, you know, like the mm. Nikanj was undergoing through with the with Ahja and Dichan and Lilith. I th- that's the mm. second metamorphosis. Mm-hmm. So Akin is also will be looking for a male and o- sorry female and Uloi counterpart, mm. and I wonder if they're gonna also include humans in this as well, or is it just gonna be pure construct? Um, I I don't know because I mean it it seems like there's still the constructs are kind of a bit like the the human pairing where you end up with kind of five almost right where you've got yeah. the um the human and the Oankali males and females and then the Uloi but uh, I don't know how like to what degree that uh, continues uh, mm. for how long how many generations as it were of, mm-hmm. of construct crossing yeah you, you continue in the kind of pattern of five as opposed to the pattern of three um we don't know we don't know but mm. yeah it's I feel like it's a crazy mess of um mix and probably hard for the kids to go through themselves and and even harder for the parents to dis- decipher. I mean, it's already hard for mm. our parents to decipher what the hell is going through our minds when we're going through puberty. I can't imagine in here in this case. Yeah, but now it's, there's like two entirely different understandings of, of what happens to yeah. you as you uh, go through the maturation process, right? There's the Oankali things and then there's the human, human things. things and the, the Oankali parents kind of expect it to follow the Oankali pattern and the human so parents like, expect well, it to actually, follow the human yeah. pattern. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's like yeah it's crazy mm. um chatter goes on like you know it says that the tino whenever they had this conversation tino counters through that akin doesn't look like a child even though he's small but even akin himself doesn't feel like a child and whether he's mm. a fertile or not he's interested in girls and then don't mind it and as nikanj calls it he's going through a quasi-human sexuality phase so mm. it's it's you know it's something that it's a mix of two bags and you never know what you're gonna get. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Now that sounds um, like a, a bit of a rough experience. <laughs> Pretty much, like those yeah. those first constructs, you know, kids that have to go through without anybody knowing what's going on, really. Mm. And yeah. you kind of re- even pinpoint on things like, oh, you know. Uh, this is gonna happen because of this because you can't really tell because at this point it depends on like how much part of human does the construct child has and how much of Onkali mm. some may have more some may have less of each other parts or may equal and each time it's going mm. to be different yep sounds fun <laughs> 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 but yes um Dichen, though, asks Tino if Akin isn't going to resist it, which startles and angers Tino. Tino tells him that he will not stop and shouldn't because they know him and and won't harm him, opposite to what what Dichan thinks. Tino believes that Akin is learning from Dan the fact that he had to learn to fight because some of thought that his small stature was enough, uh, was an indication of him being weak. So, you know, he had to show off. And especially, mm. I can imagine then picking up Akin being a small kid, being small, when yeah. he has the strength that you no know, Lilith was given from Don Kali. I mean, like, uh, I wouldn't yeah, want to be punched. Gonna... By yeah, <laughs> this is not going to go terribly well. But yeah, I, I, it, it fits with the kind of you know the typical human pattern of yeah. you know, some some bigger kids trying to pick on the smaller one. But then, uh, uh, yeah, it turns out that's. Um, and then Akin goes Hulk and Not just crushes yet. them. Um, <laughs> Tino then asks Dichan if Akin has learned anything about the Onkali, to which he says no. So the same goes for humans. He's still learning to le- He's still trying to learn more, even though Dichan thinks that resistors are not complex except biologically. Oof! What a diss. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um. I think you may be underestimating some of what's going on there. Yeah. <laughs> Tino tells him that they still they are still resisting even though they're not complex. No, they would rather die than mm. come here and live easy, pain-free lives with you. Dichan then asks him like, if Tino's life is pain-free while trying to touch him, but Tino immediately moves away. He... Mm. And he can't understand it, like, and this is the exit from book. He had finally gone for Lilith to, to Lilith for help in understanding this. You're one of his mates, she said, she had told him solemnly. Believe me, 
Chan. He never expected to have a male mate. The kanji was difficult enough for him to get used to. And the Chan didn't mm -hmm. think so. He thought that Tina was okay with Nikanji. And for some reason, after long, unforgettable group matings, Tina would avoid him. Yeah, the Lilith wouldn't avoid Achtjes. Hmm. Yeah, it's a, a, an interesting one. Like, long, I, I unforgettable group matings. <laughs> I love that description. Yeah, and it, it leaves um, plenty unsaid, right? Yes. <laughs> that little <laughs> taste in your tongue is just like... Mm -mm -mm. Dichan, Dichan. <laughs> no. You little scoundrel. The, uh, I think this is kind of an interesting. Um, uh, it's another one of these points in in the book where it feels like this. Like, one of the kind of the ongoing themes that I think like pervades a lot of uh, this series is kind of the sort of nature nurture. Yeah. Um, debate, right? There's a lot, uh, or, uh, but also you know the interaction of nature and nurture and how they they like play together to shape what you actually end up being. Mm -hmm. And um, which I think, and it's a really interesting discussion. It was kind of a, um, you know, a hot button issue in the era around when this was written. Although I think some of like the the sophistication of the the discussion of it in um, Octavia's work kind of preempts a lot of the. Um, so, for example, like um, one of the landmarks in this kind of intellectual history of discussion of the the nature nurture thing was uh, Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate mm -hmm. um, and that was uh, what was that 2002 I think mm -hmm. um, so that's 15 years after the first of these books was published yeah um, so yeah as usual a little bit uh, ahead of the curve on, on the, the way that the Octavia does commentary uh, but uh, I think one of the things that she she does well with it is she kind of doesn't pick a side too yes. much, right? She she actually emphasizes kind of the emphasizes the the nature via nurture or or the the interaction of environmental and biological factors. Uh, it, it's it, it's a much more kind of um, sophisticated mm. understanding of uh, how biological factors are, are manifest, right? It's yeah. not biological determinism. It's predisposition that is plastic to environmental influences yeah. right? the specifics of the environment can change the and interact with what your uh, biological leanings might be and, and mm -hmm. even shift them right there's a there's a so some degree of causal feedback loop there and that i think shows in, in a lot of the uh, the ways that she explores these topics no absolutely absolutely and i think for concerning the fact that you know um, at the time the books came out, I can imagine the, the still the whole idea of um, same-sex relationships. And although it was 1980-something, right? 87. Yeah, so, I mean, it was still... A, yeah. it, and, it was, and she was in California, so it's a little yeah. bit more... Uh, Left-leaning in, in some ways, but also plenty of uh, plenty of uh, that are strongly religious groups, and you know, she had a religious upbringing. So yeah. there's a, you know, a lot, lot of different tensions in there. And I think that's one of the tensions that's that's in this point, right? You have yeah. Tina, who's kind of uncomfortable with this sort of same-sex aspect of his relationship with Dishan, but it's uh, you know he had also a kind of religious upbringing, right? We we don't we hear know much about of, what it is. Yeah, but we know that because mm -hmm. Phoenix had you know the whole idea of previous part talking about the you know hmm. the cross and the phoenix and the fact that you no know, there is a church uh, we are told i think if i remember correctly in phoenix yeah and they were trying to write down the whole what, bible what they could recall from the bible yeah. and, and you know yeah so we don't get much explicit indication of what their um position on homosexuality is but generally speaking religion doesn't have a great track record in that regard no uh, well yeah <laughs> Um, but yes, I, 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 it's, it's, it's probably the whole. In terms of like, um, it's also probably the fact of the sexuality, right? It's, it's the fact that you no, know, mm. that the onkali are labeled as male, and I think it will, mm. although it might not be the same aspect as the same male version as we are thinking of, right? Because Nikanj or Chitaya, I think in book one said it's like a version of. Um, it's like a version of male and female, but not exactly. And um, so I don't think we can even compare it as uh, being as it is. Well, to I mean, the, if 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 you get back to the like the biological fundamentals, right? It's you know the the males have the small gametes and the females have the big gametes. 
um, well, yes, yes, that's what I mean. But like that in biology, yes. But then you know, it's it's not in the same aspect as we are as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, ah, just does you know, pop out the kid from uh, uh, from a pre no, not pre made, but on the ta- on the spot made uh, hole. But um, <laughs> still, like you. I don't think you can think of them in the same aspect because they also have an Uloi. Like it's that's the thing, right? There's a third yeah, party yeah. involved. So mm-hmm. yeah, I mean that that it, it's definitely complicated <laughs> in that regard. Yeah. No. Although that that's like the the cultural aspect of it, but one of the 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 biological things that might be um, like underpinning the the difference between the way that uh, Lilith is reacting to um, Dahajus versus how um, Tishan and, and Tino are reacting mm-hmm. is that um, like bisexuality is slightly more prevalent in females than males. So I think if I'm remembering the stats correct, it's 93% of males in kind of like global averages of surveys are heterosexual and uh, exclusively, and 87% are females, and then about 10% of females are. Um, kind of on the like uh two to three in the kinsey scale type region so they're like incidentally homosexual uh, with only about one percent of females being uh four on on the kinsey scale so the, the kinsey scale by the way to put that in context like zero on the uh, no so one on the kinsey scale is completely heterosexual seven is completely homosexual four is like no strong preference and then there's like two levels of preference on either side right uh, okay and then, so the um, uh, and then in in males, it's a bit different. So then, it's I think it's four uh, percent in the kind of two to three on the Kinsey scale, mm-hmm. and 0.5 on the uh, four-ish region. So that uh, no, there's a, there's a bit of a skew right. towards uh, females being slightly more uh, predisposed uh, to uh, be an incidental. Uh, and even incidental uh, more equal. <laughs> yeah that's that's the word they use oh, okay, <laughs> In- okay incidental i was going to say incidental like i yeah. mean oh i accidentally you know ended up you know making out this girl as like that's not an incident <laughs> that's just you know but th- it's an interesting question do they explore why uh in particular is there like uh biological um, I- be- reasoning behind it I don't know if we know that. I mean, I was thinking about it a little bit, and I came up with something that might be an okay evolutionary psych kind of just so story, but it is just a you know, it's very much an untested hypothesis. So I don't know if it's can I before actually you, underpinning. Can it. I guess? Mm-hmm. Can I guess before you go on? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, I feel it's because of the survival of like upbringing as well, because if you have children. Mm-hmm. Um, and for example, you know, males go hunting evolutionary, right? And they're just gone mm-hmm. or something happens. There's a higher survival chance if you are together with someone of the same sex, like women to being together and then forming sort of family unit in a way. That's my thought. Yeah, I think that's definitely one component of it, right? So in situations where um, you have a higher probability of having like... Um, a, a smaller number of males with a, with a large number of females, right? So it might be the males die, or it might be you have a situation where you have like a harem type scenario where you've got a, a, a male with a lot of resources mm-hmm. in some societal structures, right? Either of those situations has a a, a slight uh, like asymmetry favoring the uh, formation of like collaborative relationships with between females to raise offspring. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that I think contributes to the asymmetry is um maternal certainty and paternal uncertainty right? right so it's easier for women to collaborate in raising offspring because they know which offspring is theirs so they can like uh make sure that the resources they get from the collaboration go to their offspring but men have a harder time organizing into those kind of collaborative groups because they don't have paternal certainty right yes um, i see what you mean yeah so there's, I think there's a few contributing factors to that but i think there's a there's a, a reasonable case that that might be a, an evolutionary game theoretic underpinning of of why that's a slight bias um interesting need to run some simulations <laughs> simulations um 
I was also thinking about maybe the hormone hormones uh, associated, you know, like with the whole. Um, but that would be, uh, I think, a very very long shot, and mm-hmm. maybe not really relevant here. And I was just thinking because mm. testosterone makes us more aggressive, competitive, right? And estrogen makes us well more of a, mm. it's but it has some I mean, influence not necessarily. has some influence though and i'm just thinking that maybe that that um also has something to do with uh but i'm talking out of my ass right now so but i think yeah so most of that's kind of upstream of the behavioral yeah. influences though right it's the you have the the cues that follow from the hormones I and mean, one of the things that i think might play a role is the concept of um mate insurance um so it's quite common for um humans to kind of cultivate like a a a secondary relationship so if something goes wrong with the first one then they can kind of swap to the the second right um and there's some indication that uh it's anti-correlated with depression if you have good viable secondary candidates uh, as it were for a primary relationship uh so that might make sense also in in the um the uh, context of females having uh like a slight skew towards bisexuality because maybe the they can use other females as mate insurance in situations where they might have a, a, a lack of males hmm. no interesting but anyway going back to um the i think this idea is that yeah i, I guess there's a lot of um complex issues and upbring uh upbring um of tino that resulted in him not being really um happy after the long unforgettable group matings <laughs> yeah and we don't know uh, to what degree that's a biological or a cultural thing and i think that's deliberate yeah <laughs> <laughs> long unforgettable group matings i mean like if we were calling our uh episodes anything on youtube or anywhere i think that should be the title of it long unforgettable group mating <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know, man. We might have to move to a different platform <laughs> if we start doing that. <laughs> uh, to be fair, Pornhub has a really good st- <laughs> services, so who knows? Anyway, jokes aside, uh, let's continue. OnlyFans. <laughs> yeah, sign up to our OnlyFans. <laughs> uh... Oh, God. Right. Um, here's an excerpt from a book. Um, Dishan got up from his platform, left his salad, and went to Tino. The man started to draw back, but Dishan took his arms. Let me try to understand you, Chika. How many children have we had together? Be still. They had six children together. Three with Ajas and three with Lilith. Yeah, which um, they refer to in the text as the old pattern. And I'm a little unsure exactly what that, that means. It's kind of a subtly dropped hint at something. It sounds like as if, you know, the equivalent of like the Onkali children and the human children, like to keep the balance, perfectly balanced mm-hmm. as all things should be. That could probably be it, actually, yeah. And um, so Tina allowed him to touch himself, and then conversation continued. Dijan asked Tina, why does it hurt him to stay here? And he gets, you know, Tina tells him that what he we have been discussing for a long, what we have been discussing, for, he's a traitor to the humanity. Someday the people, as we we know, will cease to exist, and he is, was one of those people who helped it happen. As as he told Dijan that his stomach started to hurt alongside with his head. It seemed that the damage uh, he received has caused a sporadic uh, pain, uh, which would cause you know, um, Tino to isolate himself from others. As Dichan saw that Tino was about to suffer, he called Nikanj through the law entity. In the meantime, he asked Tino if Lily feels the same, and Tino responded to that at, the first, at first, um, yeah, but she knows now that there are no resistors that are not already parents to construct children. The difference is whether they decided to act as parents. Um, and Tino believes that they didn't help and that's what counts. But Tino wanted children and wanted to feel how Nikanj makes him feel. The mm. long unforgettable group. That's yeah, interesting. That's how he wants to <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> You're gonna keep coming back to that one. Right? <laughs> It's still on my it's still on my screen, so I'm like, yeah, it's it's still gonna come mm-hmm, back. Mm-hmm. But yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, it's interesting with them um, because we're not hearing this like directly from Lilith. We're hearing kind of what uh, what Nakanj thinks Lilith thinks. Uh, but it is it's interesting to to uh, see what the kind of uh, justification that they yeah 
uh, like offering for i mean to uh, be f- the, to mm-hmm. be fair like we are we were told that they have collected the genomic genomic sequence from all of the humans right so mm-hmm. whether the humans are part of the families or not they will use that genomic sequence to to you know the oil will brew up some kids using that genomic sequence to make sure that there is not enough genetic diversity Mm-hmm. So I see Tino's yep. point about, you know, like, it doesn't matter if they're like, it's the same thing, like, you know, if um, it's the same, I would say, aspect is like when people give children to adoption or like, because for whatever reasons, and like, you know, they, they technically know, you know, and then the kids get adopted, you know, technically their step parents are their parents, you know, but like, in the case here is like, they the original with the biological parents are not getting involved and that's what counts you know of like against the whole betrayal of humanity right it's doesn't matter for them uh, yeah i mean i suppose the 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 resistors kind of whole uh intention with not engaging with the oankali was to like to to not um mix the humans with the Owen Carly, right? So this the like the fact that they've actually uh already got all their genetics and are already using it is just kind of increasing the like the futility of the resistance yeah. kind of position, right? But it's very much against what they were intending to do by resisting in the first place. Yeah. So they are at this point, you know, cl- clinging to the to the uh like refusal to participate in raising the kids as as their only remaining uh mode of protest pretty much at uh at, at being integrated with with the yeah. Owen Carly. Mm. yeah so it's at this point like it's literally i mean we were talking about this and we were saying this this is a futile um i don't know like escape or uh it's a futile way of doing this right it's mm-hmm. you can't really do anything um it just for me is like yeah the 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 resistors keep like uh we'll get to this in a second actually and I'll point this out so the Chan moved to Tino's foot off the platform and told him to lie down here's an excerpt from the book Tino only looked at him the Chan rustled his body tentacles uncomfortably Nikan says you prefer to endure your pain it says uh, you need to make yourself suffer so that you can feel your people are avenged and you've been pay you've paid your debt to them that's shit and that's what Tino said, and as they were having conversation, mm-hmm. Nikanj arrived. The Chan tells him that Tino is insisting on hurting himself, and maybe he wants Akin to hurt himself. But Tino tells him that Akin does what he wants and understands what Tino feels better than both of them. Nikanj tells him, mm-hmm. though, that he's not part of his body, but he's part of his thoughts and he has influence over him. You've done more than Lilith would make to make him feel that why the resist had been wronged and betrayed. Um. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, actually, maybe we've skipped that part maybe earlier about the um, um, weapons. Uh, but basically, the idea is that the resistors have been producing more and more effective weapons, right? Because each time yeah, they yeah. on Kali go, they, they take the weapons away from them, but they make the more efficient ones. And... Mm. Um, Ah, sorry, it's towards towards the end of the chapter, but it's fine. We'll go. We'll get there anyway. And for me, it's mm-hmm. like if you have the if you have some people that could be scientists, right? Mm-hmm. I would do anything trying to like tr- understand what is the reason behind the block of the fertility. I mean, if you, if, I mean, I know we had this discussion many times, mm-hmm. and how many, how many sort of intermediate steps and hurdles that are necessary to do this. But it's mm-hmm. been now more than thirty years since the book started. Around thirty yeah. years, so I mean, Something it's like that. Yeah. quite a substantial time for it to like. Um, the, the, the you know the manufacturing to kick in and stuff like that yeah uh, yeah but i mean the, the you you're you're bootstrapping from from nothing yes right? yes yes absolutely it's you know you're going from subsistence to but in the meantime yeah, i mean I, I i can see how they would like iterate a little bit on basic firearms design if they have like prior knowledge of some of that no 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 absolutely but i'm thinking yeah, is that like yeah. 30 or more years in fact because we, this book starts but we all like 
if you really mm. wanted to do a change, like really have make a change, you wouldn't make villages. You would comp- try to combine everyone into massive, big, massive nation and try p- pushing into a manufacturing, like and start trying to understand mm. and put into research and stuff like that. Because at this point, like the whole complaining, like I understand that things take time and they are starting from zero, but at this point, it's very. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it's the the usual kind of collective action problem yeah. type scenario, right? You've got all these disparate groups from different human cultures that before the war were presumably at war to some degree, yeah. <laughs> and you know they all speak different languages. They've all been kind of seeded in different parts of this forest. They've come out from the Orankali in their own little groups. So yeah, it's, like having them pull together is a, a challenge. Yeah, it would be a very massive challenge. You'd have to have really people who modified by Don Kali able to remember everything and learn all the languages and I basically act as a, in a way, tra- initially translators and co- like connecting pieces to help them understand. Yep, but then anyone who had done that would have been treated with suspicion for having gotten too close to the own Kali. <laughs> well, yes, that's the other thing. But honestly, if, at mm-hmm. this point, you either you know start pushing forward towards this, or you'll be just in a perpetual cycle of self hate and basically having no hope. Hmm. Yep. Yep. And it is kind of interesting. There hasn't been more kind of. Um... Uh, like leadership figures in the resistance emerging. To be fair, like yeah, I would expect it more. Like, I would expect mm. somebody to really try to... Because um, I've been saying about like the whole civil war, I was expecting some like a radical <laughs> raising up and trying to unify the whole, you know, remaining of humanity. Mm-hmm. But yeah, uh, I was just, I just thought that at this point, like, you know, the whole idea of them making weapons and stuff like that. and But yeah, anyway. So mm. Nikanj then notices that Tino is working on another ulcer. It tells Tino that it knows that Tino wants to die and live in the same time. The fact that he loves his children and his parents generates a conflict in him. It knows that he loves them as well, but he thinks he shouldn't. Dichan then notices that Akin told them about one of the men who died of an ulcer when he was first kidnapped. The fact that the man's ulcer was known to the his alloy, but the man refused to be treated. Nikanj then puts Tin to sleep and proceeds to ask Dichan what he asked Tino that caused a flare-up, to which Dichan tells him mm. that he asks him about the Akin's disappearances. Ah, you should have asked Lilith. I thought Tino would know. He does, and it disturbs him very much. He thinks that Akin is more loyal to humanity than Tino himself. He doesn't understand why Akin is so focus- focused on the resistors. Dichan didn't realize mm. how focused Akin was. Even though he had the same people deprive him from their sibling bonding, Akin will try to save them. Although he cannot think of a way how he would go about doing it. Nikanj hopes that maybe he will stop being occupied with it once he undergoes the metamorphosis, but according to Dichan, it must be more to it than that. Nikanj then tells Dichan that humans are full of contradiction even though human bodies aren't just human cells. There are a great number of bacteria living in us in a symbiotic behavior, trying to protect us. Humans couldn't survive without them, but even though those relationships frightened them. But Dichan tells him that the Onkali are not like mitochondria or bacteria and the humans know it. They shouldn't lie to humans. Maybe it would, and maybe it'd be better not to say anything. Um, hmm. That's an interesting, uh, interesting set of stuff there. The whole uh, relationship with Tino being concerned that uh, Akin is like adhering more to kind of the principles of the resistors than than he is. Yeah, uh, and you know, having these almost like psychosomatic symptoms from the contradictions that uh, he's enduring. And the thing is, one thing I don't understand here in this the last sort of um, interaction is that, you know, that 
he the Chan tells the uh, tells him that Donkai are not like mitochondrial bacteria, and the humans know. Obviously, they're not. Um, although mm. Nikachi thinks it's like um, the opposite. They shouldn't lie to humans. Maybe it'd be better not to say anything. And I'm not sure what the Chan is referring here to. Like, is he talking about the creation of the ship and eating all of the uh, biomass on the Earth? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, this is a this is a particularly interesting uh, revelation, right? Because we we kind of. Uh, we get this, there's this one line in there, one Oankali organism within each cell, dividing with each cell, extending life and resisting disease. So it seems like there is an, an Oankali organelle, right? A little endosymbiote or endoparasite, depending on your perspective, yeah. uh, that the that like interacting with the Oankali means you end up with one of these in, in your cells, right? There's a little Oankali infection, pretty much, uh, as it were that uh, follows you around so that that's uh, you know a new bit of biological information right we hadn't really uh, heard that before yeah it's 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 really um it's strange isn't it because when you think about it right so we have the male female and uloy onkali right but we also know mm-hmm. there's these versions of the onkali that are male or female who knows that like take care of the ship that they have like completely different shape than that they, they are responsible mm-hmm. for maintaining the ship then we know there's the ship itself that has apparently some sex um mm-hmm. and then then we know that the later on we're told about the shuttle that it's a male and it's like mm-hmm. so it feels to me that the concept here is that the onkali are not what they seem to us like you know we the, the humans in the book call them male female or whatever but the fact is that it's more than that it's 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 a collective sort of organism i would say that um has, just takes different forms hmm. I mean, it seems like the kind of uh the essence of the oankali in some sense is this organelle yeah. right this this uh this, there has uh, to be something connecting all of those you know hmm. concepts and organisms hmm. but it's kind of uh like steered by the uh the the uloi who have some kind of high level uh control yeah over what sorts of things the these organelles can be set off to do um but yeah it's like a, a, a kind of um a kind of nanotechnology, a kind of bio nanotechnology, where they have this little, you know, ability to put these kind of uh, Oankali organelle payloads in yeah. people and have them change as a result. It feels to me though like it's yeah, it's it had to be some unification between because like, it's there's so many concepts uh, with the Oankali and the, all different organs connect. There has to be some unification, and it seems to be that 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 the whole. Mm. Whatever it is in Onkali, whether it's some sort of organelle or whatever else, is just what the real original Onkali is. And probably we'll mm. hear more about it in the next chapters. And it, it seems that whatever systems are associated with this are what kind of facilitates the the gene flow between yeah. all these different um, like morphs, as it were, of the Onkali species, sort of, or, or like relatives. Yeah of the Oankali species that are uh, kind of their own lineage, but also, you know, have, have some, some shared characteristics, but it, I suspect that they all have this, uh, Oankali organelle in there, uh, and a, as a, as a, like a common interface. Yeah. 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 <laughs> mm. Yeah. So that's a, yeah, a, a fairly, uh, major like revelation about the, the way that the Oankali biology works. Basically. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> mm. Um, Nikanj tells him that if they say nothing, humans assume the worst, which is very true, I would say. Um, mm-hmm. The topic then drifts onto Tino and uh, if Nikanj could help him, but it tells Tichan that no, but it'll take care of him. Um, also, he can't stop him from hurting himself unless uh, it removes his memories, but Nikanj won't do it because it values Tino too much as a being. Um, the chapter ends with Dichan saying that he will separate Akin from the resistors. He fears that the humans will kill him sooner or later because no matter how many times they confiscate the weapons, the humans make a new set more efficient and better. That's what I was talking about earlier. He will take the mm-hmm. he will take Akin to the main ship to let him learn about the Onkali side. 
Tichan could sense that Nikanj will feel lonely because Akin always brings him something from his travels and is the closest of what an Uloi child would be. So he promises that he, Nikanj that he'll take him only for a year. And that's where the chapter ends. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting little um, variant on like paternal uh, feelings relating to the the way that Akin's going out and collecting stuff for, for Nikanj, right? It has this kind of you know, it's, it's a very like alien biological activity, but it has this kind of like feeling that you know, like Nakanj is going to get empty nest syndrome. Yeah, when he, uh, absolutely. Uh, when he's no longer getting that exchange, yeah, or it. Rather. It's interesting because, like, um, in the book, it says that you know they spend sometimes hours exchanging information, all the things that Nikanj collected on his travels and on his wanderings and uh, with Nikanj and it gives Nikanj a massive pleasure to to do this with Akin so yeah it feels for Nikanj that it's uh, um, too early I just realized mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. I understand why they haven't created an Uloi construct okay because the Uloi construct would reverse the pro with the um, the the fertility issue in humans. Imagine an Uloi construct that goes into what does what Akin did, like what goes mm-hmm. to be gets kidnapped and taught by the humans, and then understand the whole idea that the humans need, uh, you know, be able to, you know, have their own children. The Uloi construct would yeah. be able to do that because ha- the Uloi's have the mm-hmm. ability to, but that's why they haven't created it. Ah. The Ula constructs would have like they're, they're kind of you know they're afraid of them yes. because they have the most power to to change things. So if they have an Ula construct, then it might do something that they don't want. Exactly. Uh, they don't want it to do. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. Now I understand. <laughs> Got him. Got him, coach. Got him. <laughs> now. I, Returning a little bit to what we were talking yes, about before in, in this whole thing, like it seems like they're not, um, was it Deshaun's kind of referring to something that they're not telling the humans yeah. and this whole, uh, like, are they a symbiotic relationship or, or something else? Definitely not a symbiotic relationship, no matter what yeah. Nikanj thinks. <laughs> yeah, so Nikanj's perspective on it was like uh, as much of a symbiotic relationship as humans was originally with, or, or like uh, I suppose eukaryotes were originally with with the mitochondria or like proto eukaryotes. Uh, so I mean, it, it it seems likely that there was at least at some point a kind of parasitic, yeah, relationship between the uh, like the host cell and the um, the mitochondria that like evolved into a more mutualistic yeah. one uh we, we see that with um endoparasitic organisms today right i mean um so uh, chlamydia for example is uh, an an endoparasite right? it goes in it, it grows and multiplies inside your cells not merely like around them uh, you know eventually we kind of like co-opted somehow you know there was a a, a positive sum game that could be played between the mitochondrial precursor and the eukaryotic cell precursor basically Richard just compared Onkali to Chlamydia nice <laughs> I'm joking I'm joking but yes absolutely yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing is in a lot of diseases plus viruses for example do this right do this right some mm. of them attack specific um, um, cells and then stay in them forever if, um you know, there are some cases, I don't want to say at the top of my head right now because I know I'll be wrong, but I'm aware of there are some diseases that basically once you get them, they stay forever with you because... Um, yeah, it's a, what is it, an endoretroviruses, yes. ones that end up splicing themselves into your yeah. genome. So, and to be honest, this is uh, true because, for, for example, transposons, are basically a remnants mm-hmm. of such viruses that are within our genome, but most cases they are usually um, s- um, silenced by either uh, epigenetics, like modific- epigenetic modifications or specific cell, uh, specific protein cycles, uh, enzyme cycles, for example, like pi RNAs uh, on ping pong. But stuff like that, you know, is within our cells. But I don't know. Give a little bit of context on that. So, like, uh, 
transposons or transposable elements or retro transposons that whole class of thing they're, they're like repetitive pieces of dna sequence that occur at multiple copies uh, in our genome yes. and and they have a propensity to jump around right so they, they make copies of themselves and end up uh, elsewhere in the genome. yeah and uh, sometimes parochially referred to as jumping genes you can imagine how problematic that is because you know if the transposon copy and paste itself somewhere that's not really used by our genome that's fine but if it copies itself somewhere in between a very crucial gene that that will lead to a cell death and basically death of the organism so that's the reason why Mm. we have those systems to silence them um but yeah they are basically remnants of but we also have uh situations where the elements that were originally in one of these transposons or that they kind of might have had an, an origin in, a, in a, a viral element has some regulatory function which ends up being co-opted and used in our normal course of regulation right so the promoter from a gene that was originally in a virus might end up being the promoter of a gene that we now use for other stuff right or, or an enhancer or you know, some other regulatory so, uh, element that controls its expression when you think about it richard right mm-hmm. what knowledge do onkali have to understand all of this like imagine like you know we're studying you know our evolution evolutionary you know um development and you know genome we're using genome sequencing and we are sort of starting mm-hmm. to understand all of these concepts you know and then a, a being like a onkali comes over and is like after a few years of like under- trying to understand the genome it's just like yeah that's that's you know that's what it is and I just don't know. I can't wrap my head around this still. <laughs> I mean, it feels like they just have much better... I mean, for starters, much better like instrumentation. Right? They have almost like a, a direct perceptual ability to kind of see what's going on in genomes. Uh, and then there's also the... Um, like, they, they have experience at this, right? They're, they're like experienced genetic engineers. So they, they have this sort of, uh, you know, fairly deep extensive cultural yeah. knowledge of how the sorts of things that f- act in gene regulatory networks function right they have a, a presumably some richly developed understanding of the sorts of uh, like uh, regulatory networks that exist in biological systems can be manipulated mm-hmm. which we don't really have very well developed yet <laughs> yeah but it just it just really blows my mind that you know that there's they have this ability to do it when we have still struggled to understand mm. some things like only for example recently like we thought about uh that you know whatever the mrnas that are not used they just get degraded and you know ciao ciao whereas in reality some mm. of them actually are reused for regulation stuff and you know micro iron are called micro rnas and it just each time, obviously, the organism, our bodies will reuse things because just wasting some, like, not use, reusing stuff is wasteful and a waste of energy. But nonetheless, it's it's a very complex system. I just cannot understand, like, cannot imagine what processing power does the Onkali brain have to have to be able to, like... Yeah, that is an interesting point, actually. And, and it, one of the things that might be a, a, a challenge to the like the realism of, of of having this level of understanding of these systems is it might be the case that in some sense these complex biological networks are like computationally irreducible yeah. right you you can't necessarily uh like understand and generalize from them uh without effectively just simulating them uh, which incurs you know extensive computational uh, costs Basically. Uh, to actually run them right uh, i feel like they would have to we have don't, so we have to kind of posit in this world that there are some uh sufficient like reductions to generalized abstract rules about how uh biological networks work unless that there's useful insight to be gained. unless you know like imagine you have a number of onkali right of uloi onkali i'm talking about mm-hmm. uloi onkali and Mm-hmm. one alloy takes care of this pathway this one against this one and then all those like this sort of like in the collective understanding share their knowledge or at 
actually the other thing right yeah to having sufficient computational capability to actually just run this so one of the things that's quite interesting there is they have they, they could potentially just do a lot of the experiments yeah. right they could just make cells that have a variant on a given network and see yeah, what exactly. happens empirically right uh, because they have such a uh, potential granularity of control over these biological systems they can just program up a, a prototype cell and see what it exactly. does Right. For us, that's a lot of work. For them, it might not yep. be. Uh, so that's you know that gives them a, a, a massive edge in being able to figure out this stuff uh, just empirically. Yeah. So I was just thinking because they do have those collective meetings, it could be the case that sometimes they have the collective meetings where they do like you know connect to each other and then just do a massive like brainstorm, literally, of you know trying to uh, mm -hmm. like have a cell and then just throw stuff at it, be like you know fertilize an egg yeah, and yeah. then or just sharing their results yeah. right uh, they could have done a bunch of distributed computing and they're pulling it together to to figure out to share what the results were you know which, which bits and you worked. know they have time i mean uh, since earth mm. the whole war it was like 200 something years they have time to share all of that information and then understand yeah, it yeah. so it could be that they their mm. understanding is pretty deep on this aspect yeah yeah and actually, it mirrors some of the stuff that's being done in, in cutting-edge modeling of biological networking. Um, in the, We're not really doing it in um, like actual cells, but rather we're doing it as um, analog computations. Yep. Uh, so taking... Uh, one of the problems that you run into with a digital computation is you have a, a limit of resolution mm. on your... Uh, the state that you can represent with any number right so you, if it's like 32 bits long then if something happens that affects the like the rounding error at the end of that then you might miss the effect yeah. in, in the larger network yeah. right and there, there's a lot of things in biological networks that are kind of determined by really like subtle continuous Absolutely. changes right there's a lot of kind of uh, analog computation so one of the things you can do to get around that is model um instead of doing digital modeling have analog computers that can represent continuous signals uh, sort of out beyond that level of uh, how, uh, precision how do you do analog computing like can you go more detail about the whole concept of it i mean i don't really know okay. that much about how exactly it, i mean it, typically you end up representing your system as kind of a series of um like differential equations right, that okay, describe okay, okay. The, the relationships between systems and then that kind of gets represented effectively as like a continuous um field of some kind maybe like an electrical signal or like an amount of, of res uh, resistance or current or something. I, don't, I don't know what they typically use to actually mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know there's some some continuously varying value in an electrical circuit um i mean it's like the difference between um you know, digital and analog audio. No, absolutely. Right? I understand what you um, mean. It's just, I just thought that yeah, yeah. Uh, what sort of hardware or whatever the ideas that there is utilized to, to actually do this. Mm. Um, um, I, I, there's some very cutting edge stuff um, from, I think it's MIT, it might be, I forget if it's MIT or Harvard, uh, working on the equivalent of FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, which are like um, uh, effectively digital circuits for computers it's like programmable hardware mm -hmm. right you, you can tell an fpga what like type of uh transistor like behavior you want a given like node in this this array to to behave like so you can effectively make your own hardware circuits for doing things like designing asics and okay. stuff for, for application specific hardware but there's a version of that for analog computing that's being worked on I see. by um What's that? There's a there's a particular. It's okay. I don't uh, have to like. We'll in, we'll yeah. probably find later for in the comments or something um, in the references. Hmm. Um, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, but that that's a whole potentially quite interesting area of, uh, of research. Absolutely, but it's really interesting because now we're doing a massive historical back to the original computing, right? It was usually like, you know, it was connecting transistors together and what, what's on so and, you know, to, to be able to do certain um, mm -hmm. computations. And now we are going back to it, but in this, because it was uh, well, obviously more uh, sophisticated way, but um, to be able to understand certain yeah, concept, I mean, the, concepts. The, the, 
interesting thing about biological computation is it is hybrid, yeah. right? It's a hybrid of digital and analog computation. Right? You've got digital information representation in the yeah. genome where you have you know fixed uh, stuff, but then you also have a lot of continuous signals with like the the uh, concentrations of various factors Absolutely. in different compartments and and these kind of like threshold effects or, or, and you know um, kind of semi digital stuff like phosphorylation state where there's a lot of proteins where how much uh, how phosphorylated something is uh, or like how many phospho groups it's got added to it determines various threshold things there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going on at, at the level of uh, gene regulation that is non uh, digital yeah it, 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 it's it's much more uh granular there's many levels of, of sensitivity yeah i there. just oh yeah. i just can yeah you really have to apply this sort of modeling to to it because you can't just uh apply a very endpoint behavior like behavior to those things because there's also so many modifications and then you can have like for example um for those who don't know uh, who didn't not know much about for example um uh ubiquitin which is a pr uh, protein that's used mm. for often to like de um, send proteins for degradation you add people mm -hmm. you know there are enzymes that add ubiquitin to um to a protein and then basically that's a signaling for the protein to be degraded but fun fu but guess what not always sometimes you can use ubiquitin as a um as a means to signal something and if you add a for example certain <laughs> amount of them for example like recently because i'm my now current specialty is crohn's disease there's a pathway that actually involves you know like if you add that many ubiquitins to this particular uh, amino acid it will do this thing but if you add the other one this uh, many different different number of, of ubiquitin you'll end up with different behavior and it's just like Mm -hmm. Yep, and and you can attach it what one or two what a couple of different yeah, locations, and then right? you can have ubiquitin <laughs> other modifications added to ubiquitin and then have chains of it, and then it'll also cause different behavior. So and the branch exactly. Patterns, so have fun. <laughs> it just goes yeah, on. Have now. fun trying to understand yeah. all this nonsense. Yeah, as so I whenever I have to like talk about biology to to computer science and programming type people, I'm like biology is the worst legacy code problem in history. Honestly, it really is, and the thing is. It's it's interesting concept because um, the current project actually we have a fellow who is creating a database, and I really feel for him mm -hmm. because we're doing more of like a macro scale, so cells, tissue layers, and stuff like that. And he's mm -hmm. developing a database for for this. And and when he was first starting, I really I was sort of annoyed, but now I really feel for him because I understand that. His from his perspective, he was supposed to create a database, and obviously databases are um, structured, you know, of the of parent, mm -hmm. and then because you know the sub um, sec, you know, sub um, levels, and then you have things like mm -hmm. epithelial cells, and you have epithelial cells everywhere, <laughs> and you're like, where do you put this? You know, you can't really, you know. Put it. Uh, you can you can obviously put at the very low level of at uh, this tissue, but you can also put it in a different tissue. And it's like, how do you make the connections? Like which and it's and it's still epithelial cells. Like so, when he had struggling, yeah. co grab his you know wrap his hand or, uh, head around this the concept that yeah, those things will repeat, and there's a lot of things that will be like oh, the actually mucosal layer is actually present in several places, and it's the same thing, but it's not, but it is. <laughs> Yeah, you, you can't. You, you got to kind of give up on the database thing and go directive as, directed acyclic graphs, sort of. Sometimes, yeah. That helps, I just, but, <laughs> but I generally, generally do feel it, it, sorry really not, for him not at all easy. because it's the concept of the ideas that the things in biology repeat themselves. Because one, repeat, repetition of things is good for energy usage, and two, because mm. it's recycling of things, and it's just. Yeah, and we just, mm. it's just, uh, it's, I can understand and how difficult concept this is. And whenever, whoever tries to, you know, do anything more moderately more complex than the very simple models, then you're basically fucked. <laughs> yeah, so d data modeling for biology is just like not fun. Um, really? <laughs> I mean, this is why the whole like um, worst legacy code problem in history thing is, you know, we only have the machine code. It wasn't written for like one consistent instruction set yeah. architecture. It encodes all of its own hardware. Yeah. 
not to mention <laughs> whatever else of the stuff that it's doing. Plus, it's uh, it, it's it's not even um, it, it, it's not even just digital, right? It's it's a hybrid digital yeah. analog system. Um, plus, it was designed. Well, it wasn't designed. It, wasn't. Right? it, it was written by a literally non sentient yeah. process, right? So it's not like the guy who wrote the code before you was an idiot. It's the guy who wrote the code before you literally wasn't even conscious. Yeah, exactly. He didn't even know what's <laughs> going on, but he was still doing it, and it's still like was bumping things together and see if it works. But the thing is, um, it's no. it's very interesting because. If- yeah. Oh, oh, and it, it's undergone a brutal optimization process with shifting goalposts for the last four yeah. billion years. Um, but the thing is, <laughs> like for all those people who are listening, um, um, I just wanted to say that it's it's still not a when we when scientists do any type of research, right? For any of us, we've said this a few times, but I'll reiterate this here again. Whenever we look into things, we always. Um, look at the one variable at a time. We try to look at one variable at a time because um, anything more complex than that in any sort of experimental uh, uh, aspects makes the experience very, very complex and difficult to get your head, head wrap, you know, wrap your head around it. And so mm-hmm. we do follow up with you know one variable at a time to see usually time or uh, concentration of things in cell culture or whatever. Whatever it is, it's usually one variable at a time. But I do remember a paper that we, uh, back in PhD, I don't know if you were there, Richard, mm-hmm. as well, maybe you weren't, but we, it was about basically a uh, paper about looking at multiple variables at a time. So they were doing an analysis, and I think it was a, it was, it wasn't a, it was a combination of many different researchers that look in one variables, but they were combining all of those at the same time and looking into the distrib. And yeah. I need to say, those graphs didn't make any sense to me because they were drawn in the per- uh, like a pyramid uh, way. So you obviously have interactions with you know each thing interacting with each mm. thing, and with each thing you had a heat map with a, also a pie chart in it and. It was just a mess because it just showed. Yeah, I mean, you, you just get a combinatorial yeah, explosion bas- of, of possible interactions. Yeah, factors. basically, you, if you looked at it, you would know that, like, you, you had, it had, like, the graph had three dimensions plus all those interactions together, and it just basically was a giant bloody mess. It made sense. If they were like, oh, you know, this concept, like, if you look at these variables together, these variables have predominant effect compared to the other ones. But. Hmm. It was a, a it's just a pure mess. So I, yeah, I mean to to take it back to the programming analogy, right? It the code has a lot of side effects. Yeah. Right? There's not like a nice, clean, functional, referentially transparent setup where you know you call the function, it does only one thing, it returns the result. No, everything talks to everything yes. else, right? The b- biology like hates restrictive yeah. scope. Everything is a global scope, and everything affects Basically. everything else. <laughs> <laughs> Everything is a global variable, uh, and if you don't like it, then you know it sucks to view. Yeah, it's like worst possible code programming design practices, uh, just like implemented in there, and like everything's a crazy hardware hack that makes use of weird, unexpected you know behavior from the underlying biology. System. <laughs> biology is the programming language that constantly uses go to function. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's that's what it is. Yeah. Basically, uh, you cannot go to biology without rechanging your idea of not using go to uh, function in your code. Because if you do, if you do, then sorry, you're not, it's not gonna work. <laughs> yeah. So, so all you like C systems programmers out there who think that your like memory bugs are, are weird and nonsensical, like come to biology. <laughs> we, we we feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! <laughs> I guess we have uh, drifted above the main. Uh, well, not drifted, but we did go off tangent a bit, and we still have a chapter to cover. So, yes, let's uh, pull yes. it back onto <laughs> onto the the direction. Um, so, should we do your your uh, prediction? Sure. For so, uh, my prediction was: Akin is being told about going to the ship to learn about the Onkali part of his life. Um, to which maybe Ank- initially Akin is not happy because he feels he needs to learn more about the humans uh, and spend more time mm-hmm. with them and learn about them. So I feel like sort of I missed in here because I mean obviously he's going to learn about going to the ship, but he's like, yeah, I'm going to the ship. I'm let's do this, like in in a way, right? Um, 
in this chapter. He's just like, okay, I need to learn more, become an adult, and then... Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it does seem like uh, that's kind of what he's getting at. He's, he's uh, like, concerned that he's not going to be taken seriously because he's still not an adult, but uh, he's been kind of, you know, biding his time uh, until that point. Uh, yeah. so that he can but it, it, there's also there's a lot of little um uh kind of minor characterization beats throughout this yeah. this chapter that kind of give the um give the impression that um uh tino was was right about him being in a kind of uh, uh and also kind of to count about him being in a kind of quasi adolescent yeah. human state Absolutely. <laughs> so let's start the chapter i guess um so it starts mm. with akin thinking about bonds um not financial bonds but relationship bonds that his world was made up of tight units of people who treated him kindly or coldly as they choose but who could not let him in no matter how much they might want to he thought about the fact that initially mm. when his closest sibling Tikuchak, uh um i think it's Tikuchak. Tikuchak, okay was still unborn he could not reach the ta- uh, he could reach out and taste it but now after he missed the creation of the bond he didn't want to spend any time with it and now it wanted to go to Chkachta with him. I can't complain about it to Dichan. <laughs> I don't want to take my younger <laughs> brother with me. <laughs> <laughs> but he <laughs> Yep. Uh... But he was told that his siblings is also lonely and both of them need to learn more about who they are. Although Akin says he knows what he is, mm. Dichan reminds him that he's the same sex child that he, and that is about to undergo metamorphosis. And Akin knew this and needed to listen to Dichan because of his nature. I wrote it this way, but in the book it was actually more specific that when Dichan says that no, mm. he's the same, he's his same sex child and he's about to go to metamorphosis, Akin felt inclined, I think, by his nature to listen to him. Like it was biological. Yeah, but it, he also kind of felt like um, like resentful of that inclination. Yes, yes. Right? He was like going off and sulking in the forest and, and kind of pissed at the fact that he felt inclined to to do what. Yes, Dichan exactly. Said. And the book, the chapter continues. The paragraph continues that he tried to, as you said, resist that inclination, deeply resenting it every mm. time he returned to nag him, and the fact that no one came after him or seemed surprised that he came back home. So. Hmm. Yeah, he was giving a he, Akin was giving a teenage tantrums, and nobody was paying attention to him. I'm oh, so sad. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yep. Um, but this is now interesting. So we're gonna talk, be told about the shuttles. Well, this was all taking place. The shuttle that came down on the um, on the planet already ate a chunk of clearing, hmm. and this is a bit of excerpt. I didn't want to summarize because this was actually quite interesting description mm. of that it was a great green shell thing a male itself to the degree that the ship entities could be of one sex or other each one had the cap- capacity to become a female but as long as it received a controlling substance from the body of Chkachta, it would remain small and male it would extend the reach of Chkachta by investigating planets and moons of solar systems bringing back information supplies of minerals life it would carry passengers and work with them in exploration, and it would ferry people to the ship and back. Akin was never inside of one mm. and was not allowed to link to it until he was an adult. So we're uh, yes, as we talked before, um, we know that these ship entities, these shuttles, are mostly male, unless mm. the big ship, big mother ship, says, "Yeah, you can be a girl." Yeah, it's, it seems like um, a bit like. Uh, something you might get in some eusocial animals. I'm thinking of um, uh, naked mole rats, where you have like uh, the, there's a kind of queen, um, and the there's some kind of hormonal or pheromonal type influence mm-hmm. over the. Um, it's typically kind of a it's not a male morph per se, but like a a, a female morph that's that's not fertile effectively. Yeah. Right, it kind of suppresses the yeah, fertility yeah. of of like a, a female worker caste, and then you have a, a few males. Um, but I think that there are probably analogous biological situations where you might have a uh, a male that would would uh, transition to become female. Actually, that's the thing with. I think we've talked about a fish that does that before, haven't we? Yes. Can't remember which fish. Yeah, but that that general pattern. Yeah, it's a, nice to see it reused here in the context of the uh, giant spaceships. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Well, I mean, in 
as we've discussed a lot of on the summary of the previous um, part, there's a lot of topics that's gonna repeat itself because they're pretty good in terms of um, explaining some stuff. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, there are some. So yeah, we talked about the fish, and the, I think we mentioned the book one even the mall rats and the whole queen thing. Um, Probably. Yeah, yeah. but. Uh, here you put a note about the proportion system was still not stated, and it's true they didn't they didn't uh, yes. say anything because they they'd <laughs> say that um the ship like for example was like a um a hill looking thing, and whenever it's in the sky mm. it's a sphere, but we are not told anything about the fact that um it's whether it, you know what what's going what is it going to propose itself? Is it going to be like a sl slingshot? Just go boom, start bouncing up and down. <laughs> yeah, like how it transitions from the uh, uh, the hill like state to the giant floating sphere of interlocking. Because I mean, you, you have to that, uh, you have to space. reach the speed of twenty seven thousand kilometers per second to uh, to propose yourself to escape the um, atmosphere of the planet. So. The thing's gonna bounce fast to uh, to be able to. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, this is the, the the problem with the whole like slingshot style or, or like giant gun style propulsion approach is that y you have to like squash everything if Basically. you're gonna do that, right? You can't you can't put humans in uh, in a giant cannon and fire them fast enough to go into space without splatting. Basically, humans. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what's yeah. what's the proportion they're gonna use here. Is this some sort of like? Uh, as Lich, Riches loved uh, nuclear propulsion, just basically just start bouncing up. But uh, yeah, I wonder what it's gonna do. I mean, yeah, it massive doesn't really fart feel bubble. very car, it does it? I'll, I bet it's a I... massive fart bubble. It's just gonna like, and then just shoot up. So yeah, a, a conventional chemical propulsion yes. system of some kind, but <laughs> but then it's it's it seems like it's single stage, so that's not really enough. Uh... Like the rocket equation doesn't really let that one work uh, for the masses. What so if, I don't know. Um, what if, okay, mm. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking, what if the mothership extends like this massive appendage and just goes down and just attaches and then sucks it back up? I mean, it have to be like, I don't know, 200 kilometers mm -hmm. in length. Uh, yeah, potentially if even, long, even, yeah. even more. If, I mean, if, if you're out in geostation, I mean, that's what, like 34 ish thousand. But yeah, yeah, it could be something like that where you have like a, a space elevator style skyhook deal where you just sort of pull it up. Don't know. Uh, although you'd need something to to um, push your own orbit back out, right? Because you 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 deorbit yourself a little bit in pulling up whatever it was that you were pulling up. Yeah. I think uh, my don't know. My orbital mechanics are not great. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. I hope that's going to be explained later on. Uh, uh, unless Octavia mm. Butler is just like, nope, I'm not going to mention it ever again, and it's, it's going to kill you. I mean, this is one of those things where, I, because it gets so little like specific attention, I'm kind of okay with it just being in the background, right? We're just going to assume there is some like magical, impulseless pr propulsion of some kind or other that the Owen Carly have mm -hmm. cracked at, 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 at some point and, and, and we're fine, right? I don't know. They've got some you know, crazy-ass gravitational lensing deal going on, who knows? But it's, uh, you know, whatever it is, it, it's probably not, like, key to the story. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, the, the way that it's uh, been done effectively, right? We don't need to know about that aspect of their technology very much uh, because it's not particularly relevant to... to points in the plot or our, our characters but um yeah i mean it does serve as a um a big old um oh we 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 have a massive technological gap here because they're doing a thing that we yeah. don't understand that probably involves new yeah, physics yeah possibly but i <laughs> it's always one of the things that gets me in um uh like uh the alien show up movies and the military types are always like you know, well, we, how do we prepare to fight back and, and whatever it is? It's like the physicists in the room should just be like, like, no, 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 right? They're using an impulseless propulsion system, right? They have new physics. Yeah, this yeah, is like a... generally, <laughs> like it's like, yeah, we're gonna send a nuclear weapon. It's just like, yeah, think and just literally no, move no. vertically in the space in the speed that's you know it normally would kill humans or like, 
Yeah. It's like if if they've cr- like cracked inertial dampening and then they have like impulseless propulsion, we're done, right? This is not a this is not a we fight we back like scenario. Success. This is a we ask for terms yeah. of surrender scenario. Can we parley? Can we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, let's let's oh. move on. I guess. Um, Akin mm-hmm. decided that he, once he was an adult, he will speak for the resistance. At this moment, his voice would be ignored and would not be heard without amplification of another adult member of his family. Nikaj told him the story about Lilith and the fact that he was right but was ignored because of his maturity. And Akin was not going to make the same mistake. And I think the mistake he uh, references about the Paul Titus situation. Hmm. I think this is what Nikanj was talking about, the whole idea, I you know, that one thing was the Paul Titus, second thing was about uh, Lilith being um, mm-hmm. put into the prison with the humans and waking them up and then telling them about the uh, aliens without, you know, telling the, you know, the, the actual showing the aliens. Yeah, yeah I think that's actually, uh, yeah, pr- the, the primary thing was, was when you know, Paul Titus had, uh, attacked Lilith. Uh, uh, I think it was like the, the most impactful kind of occasion when, when Nikand yeah. was ignored. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's the, um, I think there were several occasions that I think we noted on where like Nikand has a point here, you should probably pay attention to, to Nikand, she's understood this better than you have. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. As Akin was looking at the hill looking like ship, he heard his name called to find Achtjes behind him. The females had 16 toed feet that allowed for walking without any sound, which was important for survival. She came to see him because once she sees him, uh, you know, because once she sees him again, he might not be child anymore. But Akin refused that because he started saying, you know, I still have a few more years away from changing. As kids do, and I just tell, tells him that his body will adjust fast and he should see everyone. Although not wanting, I just understand that he doesn't want to leave and does not say goodbye. She knew he didn't even go to his resistor friends, which made Akin feel embarrassed because he knew uh, she could tell he was with a woman even though he washed himself. Um, <laughs> she tells him that he should have gone to them as well because he may undergo metamorphosis and may not recognize him. And the chapter ends with Arches making Akin follow her to the village to say goodbyes. Hmm. Yeah, and the, the final line there is uh, he followed her back to the village feeling resentful and manipulated. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, like, yeah, so this entire chapter is just like dripping with various things where Akin's like very clearly got adolescent brain yeah, syndrome. Yes, <laughs> right? yes, it's just like, yeah, you yeah. should say goodbye. Why well, don't wonder? Yeah, I'm off sulking in the forest because I don't want to do what I'm told but I'm upset because no one's noticed <laughs> he's going through his goth phase of um, you know like no one understands <laughs> me anymore yeah, yeah right at the beginning with the different groups where it's like no I'm not part of any of these groups <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I so, mean uh, my chapter 3 prediction is basically they're gonna go back to the village probably Akin's gonna sulk a bit to not want to say goodbyes but at the end he'll have to because it's time to say goodbye and to go onto the mm-hmm. ship so you know whole teenage uh, uh, stuff and, and the... <laughs> yep uh, poor Akin <laughs> <laughs> oh boy no oh. Got some human puberty to deal with, and it's probably got all this weird on Carly shit. Yeah, I mean, the, to be honest, <laughs> the, the metamorphosis. I feel like it'd be easier yeah. not to have that human part of him, but hey, sucks to be him. Yeah, I mean, the metamorphosis thing sounds. No, I mean, honestly, t- at least as weird. <laughs> at least we don't like completely change shape or whatever. I mean, yeah, that sounds really that's weird. It. No, like you're used to you, you yourself mm. for like twenty something years, and suddenly you change your completely different person. And you're like, well, that's my life now. Nobody's gonna recognize me anymore. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So yeah, worst of, of of both worlds for the uh, the poor constructs. <laughs> Basically, yes. It's like they got they got the the very. V- <laughs> but the end of the stick so oh well hmm. anyway i guess that's it for today i think so yeah yeah thank you very much everyone to uh, for listening to our podcast we are xenothesis you can find all the places we upload our podcast on xenothesis.com i was michael glinka and i was richard Nixon. bye Goodbye. bye